This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast. Our transmasculine gender query. Where we discuss our journey through gender expression, transmasculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. This is about way more than bullies in our schools. This is about our school boards, our homes, and our country. This is about every small town, every suburb, and every city. This is about how people talk about us and treat us. This is about how we talk about ourselves and treat ourselves. This is not just about how it gets better when you get older. Do you want me to wait till later? Hell no! This is not just about being picked on for being different. It's about being queer. This is about how people assume that I'm a girl. People ask me if I have a girlfriend. People assume that I'm a boy. I am so over that. I'm so over that. I'm pretty much over that. <laughs> like the whole, when did you come out? As if it were one time. In the locker room, in the bathroom. On the first day of school. And the second, and the third. To my English teacher, to my math teacher, to my science teacher. At my last job interview. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. We can shift the conversation about gender and sexuality. This is reteaching gender and sexuality. Because we all have a gender and a sexuality. The very concept of coming out is an old, sad idea. That normal is being straight. And everything else is just LGBT. T, Q, Q, I, A, A. This is how my identities cannot be summed up in letters. Together, we're taking a deeper look at what's happening in our communities. This is how queer youth like me wind up homeless. And dropping out of school. And getting harassed by the police. This is how queer youth like me end up in jail. This is not just about same-sex marriage or military service. This is about a culture of don't ask, don't tell in my school. This is about not having supportive adults in my life up until now. And this is about needing more than just a safe space. How about liberating space? This is about being happy. This is about having a personal connection. I'm not interested in my community, just surviving. I want us to be thriving. I want my life to be awesome now. This is about young people being educators and advocates for themselves. This is about the power of a young queer person meeting another queer person. Like me. Or like me. Or like us. us. This is about people letting go of old ideas. I am a boy and a girl. I can like boys and girls. And I can be none of the above. This is reteaching gender and sexuality. And not only to the bullies. Or the newspapers. Or the president. But to our superintendents and teachers. People that write our health books. And our history books. Our social workers and doctors. Our police departments, our churches. To our friends, to our family, and to our legislators. Join us to put this on the map. Hi, and welcome to GenderCast, episode six. And this is our follow-up episode to episode five, which was our interview with Sid and Kennedy from Put This on the Map film and the Reteaching Gender and Sexuality campaign. And today we get to talk with a couple of the youth that were in the film, Put This on the Map, and we're here with both Zane and Quinn. Welcome, Zane and Quinn. Let's start out with you telling us a little bit about yourselves and what part of King County you're from. My name is Quinn. I'm 18 now, and I was 15 when we started making the film. I'm from Seattle, I, so I'm not from the east side, but I used to hang out there sometimes, so that's why I was in the film. Hi, I'm Zane, and I was, I think, 18 in the film, and I'm 21 now, and I grew up kind of in the Redmond-Kirkland area on the east side. So how did you guys meet Sid and Kennedy? Well, I met Megan, I think I was around 12 or 13, through YES, then... I think it was a couple of years later I met Sid at the Kirkland Teen Union building. So I guess I met Kennedy first, and I didn't meet Sid till we actually we finished the film, really. I met Kennedy because I started going to Be Glad, which was this support group in Redmond for queer youth. When I was 14, I started going there because I, uh, I was at Camp Ted Trees, which is this camp for queer youth. And I met someone there who's another person in the film. And I, um, I met them when I was at camp. And then afterwards, I was feeling really isolated at school and um, in my life. And so we were talking on MySpace, and they told me we, I should go to Be Glad. And that's where I met Kennedy. So was Kennedy facilitating a, the support group at Be Glad? Yeah, it was Kennedy. And then there was another facilitator who was there. Zane? 
How did you meet? I met Kennedy through YES, Youth Eastside Services, where I went after I actually had gotten back from Camp Tentries, and it was kind of my biggest exposure to the GLBTQ community, and I was just about to start junior high, and so there was a lot of things that were confusing, so I went to Kennedy for counseling, and um, I found out about Be Glad there, too. And then I met Sid about maybe a year or two after I met Kennedy at the Kirkland Teen Union building, maybe a couple years before we started the documentary. So how did you guys decide that she wanted to be in Put This on the Map? Or how did that come about? Well, for me, when I was younger, I think one of the only things that I had as a tool to connect myself to the queer community was any form of queer media, whether it was cheesy gay movies or a book I found in the library. And so when Kennedy told me about the documentary, I thought about how I had used queer media as kind of like my only connection into this big gay world and how it was kind of my escape from the isolation that I felt as a queer youth. And so to be able to be a part of something that provided that for someone else was something that really interested me. What's your favorite cheesy gay movie? They're all kind of the same. <laughs> like, I'm pretty awesome. sure the plot in every gay movie is the same. But I guess my favorite movie with gay undertones would be Angels in America. But my favorite cheesy gay movie, I think, would be Latter Days or Camp or But I'm a Cheerleader <laughs> <laughs> or all of them. <laughs> How did you decide to um, take part and put this on the map? So at the time, it was called the Be Glad movie, and I was in, um, that was actually the working title, and I was in Be Glad, and they just said, we're going to be, Kennedy was like, yeah, we're going to be making this film, do you want to be in it? And I'd been doing some sort of, some panels outside of that with another organization, and just sort of going around to different schools and organizations and talking about being a queer youth, but I hadn't been doing it much, but then... Yeah, they were just talking about being the, in the film, and it was just sort of like, well, why not? I can show up on the firehouse on Saturday and <laughs> talk. It's been about three years since you guys made this movie uh, until now. So what major or general changes has happened kind of in your life, and have any of them been due to your involvement in the film? Well, I guess one thing that I don't know, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it a change, but something that happened because of the film, I think it was last year I'd... I went back to my old high school. One of my teachers who knew I was a, a trans kid, but he didn't really understand it really, but he, you know, was accepting and tried to be supportive but never really knew how. He came up to me uh, one of the times I visited my old high school, and he was like, oh, so I saw that, that documentary you were in, and I thought that what you had had to say was very... He said, I think he said, it was very mature beyond your years, and I just wanted you to know that it really helped clear some things up for me. And I thought that was pretty sweet. Anything for you, Quinn? Yeah, well, at the time I, we made the film, I was in this very sort of normal high, mainstream high school, and I was just like this quiet, nerdy, really closeted <laughs> trans kid. Um, and so I ended up, I actually switched schools, um, and I go to a different school now that's way cooler. I guess after that I sort of like started finding like my own sort of community that I could really relate to and doing a lot more activism and queer stuff and non-queer activism stuff and <laughs> art stuff and so yeah I sort of I, I've done a lot of different stuff since then. But. So it sounds like that film's had a, a pretty good positive impact for both of you. Before the film came out I was kind of growing up as just some trans kid who knew he was gay and just wanted to be part of the gay community. That's kind of where I lived. Most of my friends were gay men and, and never really had a foot into the more queer community or fluid community in Seattle. And I felt like this documentary has kind of helped open doors into places that I've never really gone before. Not just your typical gay men or just a lesbian, but kind of like we're everything and we like everything sort of world and it's been a really cool the documentary's kind of just been like a link into that community and it was new and that's been cool one thing we talked about on the first episode was the trans community is more I feel like it's like the queer's queer <laughs> it kind of sounds like what you're talking about so one thing that we're really curious about and I know 
you talk about it some in the film, but how do you identify your gender now? And if you want to talk about sexual orientation, if that even applies, that too, but what is your identity now? I guess not too much has changed for me since the film. I guess I identify mostly just as gay male. In the past, as of mostly this year, I've kind of been more upfront about being trans. Like, if I were interested in someone romantically, I would kind of get to know them and just not spring it on them at a random moment, but I would wait a little bit longer. But now I'm kind of more upfront about it, and I feel it's easier, and I feel more comfortable being like, hey, I'm trans, and telling more people about it. And it wasn't that I was ashamed of it, but I was just, I didn't know how to identify as trans because I didn't really see myself as trans. I just, I wanted to just be seen as your typical 21-year-old gay kid. I identify as trans and I identify as genderqueer. And right now I'm sort of at this point where I definitely, I don't feel like, I'm I'm not a man or I'm not male, but I'm I feel like I'm pretty feeling pretty close to that right now, which is kind of hard because I don't really necessarily feel any need to like take hormones or get surgery or bind or anything really, and so it's just sort of like me. And so a lot of people, as soon as they hear my voice, they'll just be like, "Oh, female," and like just automatically automatically assume like. And that's, that's really kind of hard for me. But um, so, yeah, that's how I identify in terms of gender. And then I guess I identify as queer. Otherwise, I'm attracted to a, like a, <laughs> a fair amount of different people. I recently, um, I mean, over the summer and stuff, I started identifying as um, fag. But in terms of, like, being, like, attracted to, like, more, like, trans kids or, like, gender queer kids. But that also changes because <laughs> sometimes I'm... Sometimes I'm into girls, and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> yes, it's complicated. So, with Zane, when you were talking about the almost the visibility with trans, I think that that's something that we just discussed recently, but also it's something that's on my mind, is as I appear more male, how to want to be an advocate for the trans community, but not knowing exactly when to come out every single day to random people or people that necessarily I won't interact with again but still wanting to be visible and I think that it is it gets difficult as to like the timing of telling someone because I feel like sometimes you run the risk of community or friendship you're building with people them not thinking it's genuine if you don't out yourself right away so I think that's an interesting struggle and struggles that probably everybody at every age during their transition has about how that looks like and then also which she could probably speak to Jesse is the whole wanting to have the world see you and how you're trying to present to them. Like identifying as trans or genderqueer, but not having hormones and not having ops. And sometimes, you know, whether it be vocal or other indicators that would automatically have assumptions with it, like having having to navigate your community and your workplace and other places where you want to be seen one way, but may not be read that way. Yeah, I have, have the voice. I have the voice thing too. So kind of thinking back to when you when the movie was shot when the film was shot back in 08 and sort of that more high school and school experience um which has been a very long time for both of us and I don't think Sean and I I definitely didn't experience taking on these things in high school so we're curious did the topic of gender and your sexuality come up in school and if it did come up from what angle? Was it through your peers, through your teachers? What was it like for you? In high school, it was, I think I was expecting a lot more challenges than I got because I had known all the students, my peers from junior high, and they knew me as a girl. And I mean, I didn't look too different when I got to high school, but, you know, I was going by a different name and male pronouns. And I guess I was anticipating a lot more bullying or just facing a lot more problems, but before I started high school, I had a meeting with my first semester teachers, and so at least I knew I had faculty who had my back, and I think because the people who did know me as a girl liked me, and I guess kind of being the class clown, people are going to laugh at you whether they think you're weird or not most of the time, hopefully. So I only really got I guess crap for being different by people I didn't really know or who didn't really know me or know my situation. But mostly I usually had most of the kids at my school knew. So my friends usually knew. And so I at least knew that they had my back. 
but I never really faced too many challenges. Occasionally people would be like, hey, I have this really awkward question to ask you. So I heard from someone else that they heard that uh, you uh, might have maybe been a girl. And uh, is that true? Like, do you have, like, both things or whatever? Like, just really, just mostly people being uneducated about the topic, but not so much mean about it. Yeah, it sounds like more innocent curiosity. So what, you don't have to name your high school, but what town, I guess, in East King County did you go to high school? Uh, Kirkland, Rose Hill area. What about you, Quinn? I guess I got, like, a couple times people would, I, who I didn't know in the hallway would be like, call me, a, like, a man-woman or, like, a boy-girl or, like, ask if I was a boy or a girl. Like, that. that's happened at least a couple of times. And then I switched schools. So my freshman year of high school, I was pretty, I mentioned, I was pretty closeted and um, I was pretty obviously queer, um, <laughs> which some people didn't pick up on. And some, I remember I was out of class one day and my friend told me this story of, there are these kids in there who'd known me from middle school and they were debating whether or not I was gay. And they were like, no, she's totally like a lesbian. And one of them's like, no, no, she couldn't possibly be. Or like, they were like defending me. And my friend was like, um, Quinn's totally queer. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> you don't need to defend him. <laughs> like, whatever. But so yeah, there's that. And then when I got to um, my most recent school, I was sort of a lot more outward I was sort of like I would just tell people I was trans or I would just randomly say like I would say trans stuff or things about gender and then I'd be like oh I should probably explain this to you you don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> I'm a poet too so I would I have a couple times at like open mics at school and stuff I've read trans poems and then sometimes people have asked me about stuff but it's mostly just me then educating other people so it does sound like you're constantly coming out. Yes. yes. There we go. I remember one time, my junior year of high school, we were having sex ed, and someone from Planned Parenthood or someone like that came to talk to our class, and they're like, okay, kids, now we're going to write. You can have the opportunity to write an anonymous question, and so no one will know it's you. And, you know, people put, like, really immature things, and, like, just because usually by your junior year of high school and, and now – in our day and age, kids know everything about sex. But uh, I kind of put in questions that I wanted to talk about, not that I had any sort of question about. But I remember putting, I just found out that my friend is a trans. Like, I tried to word it really oddly. A trans, and, and what does that mean? And the Planned Parenthood person was great and explained what trans meant and kind of like all these other different terminologies. And I guess I kind of used that as a learning tool for my classmates they knew about me and so they probably knew that i had put it in there but i guess i just didn't i wanted someone else who was like an adult and a professional in that area to say something about it and she did and it was really cool go uh, Planned parenthood yeah. <clears throat> please don't cut their funding i guess when i think about my teenage years and not i mean i guess i was always a bit gender non-conforming but wasn't identifying as that you guys having that experience so early and, you know, navigating the school systems and your teenage years with the identity of trans or genderqueer, how do you think your life and experiences differs from someone that's cisgendered and doesn't really think about that? Well, in the film, someone kind of touches on this. It's the idea that since I was queer and since I'm trans, I've had to do a lot more questioning on my identity than someone who was cisgendered might have to do and so because of that I've sort of I feel like I'm more myself there's people who are my age that are still sort of like questioning their identity and I'm I'm definitely still like questioning parts of my identity but it's it's only because my identity shifting it's not because I don't really know who I am and a lot of that I feel like has to do with my gender and my sexuality for me I think that my life has been a lot more exciting <laughs> because of my queerness. But for me, it's been a double-edged sword. I definitely have days when I kind of just wish I could just blend into the flow of mainstream society, you know, especially as a teenager when standing out isn't always what you want to do. You know, there are times when being romantically involved with people, I'm like, this would be so much easier if I was cisgendered. But then the other half of it is that I feel grateful that I've had the opportunity to kind of see the world from two different perspectives and kind of a bigger perspective. Like, I feel like I can step back and see things that a lot of other people 
don't see because they haven't experienced the things that I have. And I think that it's kind of humbled me as a person. And so I'm pretty grateful for that. I think you're both really, really lucky. I think that because we're confronted with not necessarily following the stereotypes and the binary, we're confronted with realizing that we're different or other from an early age. So while most kids don't ever do that and they just have to think about what do I want to be when I grow up or whatever, we have to kind of navigate that system, especially as you, I think, get older and then sexuality comes into play and stuff. I think it promotes critical thinking. I also just wanted to say, like, as an activist, gender has informed everything I, like, I do just because it's like all my sort of understanding of oppression mostly comes from being trans. And so as like an activist and as someone who does a lot of like anti-racism stuff and anti-oppression stuff, it really just has impacted me in, in that way, I feel like, just because it's like I can, I can relate being oppressed in one way to like other people being oppressed. And, and I've been hearing a lot of people use the comparison of being multi-ethnicity c compared to like gender fluidity. And I think it's a good way to start the conversation with a lot of people because it makes, oh yeah, there isn't just black and white. There's all of these other people of color out there, just like there's all these genders out there. Not to say that cisgendered people or, you know, heterosexual people don't care about the world, but I definitely feel like I've gotten a lot more exposure to organizations that are trying to help change the world for better because of being trans or any part of my sexuality. And so that's been pretty cool. While I was watching the movies, one of the things that came up for me and a question, I mean, even as I'm older now and doing this podcast in part was to help me find community and network and build community here. With your age, you have less access to groups. You have, you know, depending on kind of where you live and you may not be driving or like, how do you guys tap into community? Is it online or, I mean, how do you get hooked up with other people that either understand or allies or that identify the same? I guess for me, I sort of just seeked out my own community. And so it sort of started with doing like panels and stuff like that, which I found out about through like camp or I found out about through Big Ladder stuff and then started becoming involved with organizing a festival called Bend It, which is a queer arts festival in Seattle. And through that, I sort of got involved with sort of the DIY punk community in Seattle and like queer punk community in Seattle. And that's sort of where I found most of my community. But a lot of that was just me sort of like meeting people and then them telling me to come to an event and then me meeting a different person because of that and going to shows and meeting other people. So it was a lot of just that. I, too, kind of found my community. I think each little thing has kind of been a stepping stone into something bigger. When I was younger, before, you know, I didn't drive or I didn't have really access to much of anything but the internet, I did a lot of, like, gay youth chat forum, you know, and stuff online. And then I found Be Glad, and then from there I found Camp Ten Trees, and then from there I learned about Diverse Harmony, which is the nation's first gay straight alliance youth chorus, and I guess it helped that I had, you know, a, a kind of a musical interest, so it was easy to tag on to a lot of the queer things in Seattle that have to do with being gay or being, you know, part of the queer community, and also liking music, so like through Diverse Harmony, I found out about the Seattle Men's Chorus, which I'm in now, and the sheer size of the chorus in correlation to the size of the queer community, it's very intermingled. And so I feel like each little thing's kind of just been a stepping stone into the community. I think that's just a testimony to like how important queer youth space is and having resources like that to help youth reach out to others and have a tangible lifeline to their community. So both Sid and Kennedy talked about safe space in general, the concept of it, and then they also talked about one of the domains and what they do in the workshops with Put This on the Map is talking about safe space and taking it a little bit beyond that into liberation space. And I don't know if that's something that you've thought about with them or on your own, but not just making a space where, you know, you hang a sign and it's like, okay, here, it's safe, but actually a place to kind of elevate that to a point where it's it's more about just like preventing violence. It's actually about starting a conversation. And what does liberation space mean to you? And is that something that you've thought about? Like about a month or so ago, I was in Arizona with Kennedy and we were doing, put this on the map stuff at a technical college there. And re right before we went, I wrote this poem because we were both like kind of concerned about going to Arizona with all the sort of racist, awful stuff that's been happening there. And so I wrote this poem and it was sort of comparing the 
liberation space with put this on the map to immigrant communities trying to find their own liberation spaces. And so thinking about it right now, not in terms of necessarily like queer liberation space, but creating liberating spaces so everybody feels comfortable to have their identities sort of be validated and like it's sort of beyond space safe. It's beyond like that. It's people are actually talking about stuff. And they're bringing their class, their race. Yeah, their yeah, all parts of their identities, yeah. It's definitely a new thing that I haven't really heard too much about, but the idea, it just seems so, God, that'd be so cool. Like, just growing up having a safe place was really cool, but I also felt like, okay, these people tolerate me, but they don't accept me. So I think rethinking allyship, and a lot of times queer spaces or safe space tends to be more more populated by allies because it's not a space that we actually go into because maybe of the, for that same reason we feel tolerated but not accepted and it's not like a homey or, or really comfortable space for us but I also feel like just even the term safe place and while the history of it is really rich and it is a place where it's empowered our community at some times I think even the the term safe space really gives a lot of power and weight to the bullying and or violence that's outside of queer communities or spaces that will tolerate us and I, for one, would like to see that power be taken away from that community and instead given to us to yeah. start the discussion. It was more of a punishment instead yeah. of a dialogue. Policing the behavior, that, yeah. 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 It also makes me think of um, when I was a freshman, one of the things our GSA did was we asked all the teachers who would be on this list of safe staff. It was like staff you could talk to about queer stuff, basically, or like if they didn't feel comfortable talking about it, they would refer you to someone else to talk about it. But it was just like this moment where looking at the list, you were like, oh, there's people who aren't on that. Are those the unsafe staff? Like, it was just kind of scary. The other thing we talk about, let's put this on the map, is um, not just like liberation spaces, but like brave spaces too. So like people feel comfortable to like ask questions and educate themselves. I remember, well, I was very appreciative of my high school having a GSA. It, you know, it had a few queer people, but it consisted mostly of straight allies and, you know, it did a lot of great things, and we got those all families welcome here sort of signs put in the classrooms and things like that. And so if a student would say, that's so gay or something like that, a teacher would most likely say, don't use that type of language, but that was it, you know. So then the kid would get upset, like, why can't I say that? But yeah. instead of being told why, they would just get angry. So Sid had brought up the It Gets Better campaign, which, of course, has exploded, and just that initially there wasn't a lot of youth representation in the campaign. So I don't know if either of you have any thoughts or comments that you'd like to make about the It Gets Better campaign from your perspective. We'd love to hear it. I think that the campaign itself is a really great idea, and I'm especially enthusiastic that Put This on the Map wants to get involved or wants more youth to get involved because I think while it's a great organization and campaign, I think it's also important to let the queer youth know that the life of a GLBTQ adult is rewarding, you don't have to wait till it gets better, that it can be good now, and that there are people like all the people involved with Put This on the Map who are trying to make that possible. And so instead of just telling kids that, you know, it's hard now, but it gets better, but I, I think it's really important to also let them know that it can be good now, and we're here for you if you need the support to have it be better now. Yeah, I think for me... There's this whole idea like of gets better or it waiting is just sort of a terrible idea to tell people <laughs> because for me, if when I was 14 and super, de super depressed and in school and if people were just like, it gets better when you get older, you know, and I'm like, you know, really, really depressed and maybe can't make it even through like that time of my life, then that's, you know, the only reason it got better for me was because I, I started seeking out community and because there were people like Kendi and Sid who were doing youth work and stuff like that. And then there's another thing that comes up for me a lot, which is a lot of people who um, don't know a lot about queer stuff in my life will say things like, when I'm like, ugh, this is so frustrating, this is so heteronormative, why can't it be, like, different, or, like, critiquing something, or, like, well, 20 years ago, things used to be a lot worse for queer people, and I'm like, well, one, you're not queer, you don't know anything about queer stuff, but at the same time, like, 
just thinking about, you know, like even like 20 years ago, if people, activists 20 years ago, had decided to keep waiting, what would have happened? And it's so much of people pushing forwards with whatever they're doing and deciding, no, we're not going to wait. We're going to do things right now. That is, that's how, you know, struggle is pushed forwards. And I feel like to like really honor our queer ancestors and like those people who have done that is to keep moving forward and make your life better now instead of like, you know, waiting. We've talked about sort of the gay movement. It's still going, but it's, I mean, we're getting to a point where a lot of that legislation and stuff is coming and it really the next wave is more going to be around gender and that the next movement, our movement, the social movement now is around trans stuff. This is a question for you, Zane. I was watching the movie. I thought about what my experience now is transitioning and what your experience in high school is transitioning. I was really interested to see what you feel are the benefits or how you feel things would be different or are different for you as you trans- transition so early versus waiting to your mid 20s or you know waiting till later in life but doing it essentially along your first puberty um and kind of getting to do that so not having to necessarily go through two or not having to like come out at work or or stuff like that so how do you think things are different for you doing it earlier i feel like i'm almost completely okay with where I'm at and who I am, and I don't think that I would be anywhere near where I am now if I hadn't transitioned so early because I feel like I've kind of went through my awkward phase about just growing up along with my awkward phase about figuring out who am I gender-wise, sexuality-wise, and I kind of had the opportunity to get them both out of the way at the same time. And because I started thinking about it at an earlier age, I figured things out for myself a lot faster, I think, and it as someone who's more comfortable in the skin that I'm in, I feel like it's helped the people around me, like friends, family, love interests. I think it helps them feel more comfortable around me as well. And I feel grateful for the fact that I had the support that I had had when I was younger. And I don't really think about it because it's just how it's been my whole life. I definitely appreciated not having to go through puberty again, like in my 20s. You know, when I first started high school, I hadn't started T yet, but people didn't really question because it's, you know, 10th grade, still kind of an awkward age for kids. So I felt like it also helped me pass better, which, again, boosted my confidence. And so I think it's made me feel more comfortable just as a person. So one of the things, and this is also something that I think about, too, now that I'm trying to be seen more as male, I notice a lot of things that I feel have been socialized. So I wonder... During that time where you started to take tea and you were wanting to pass more as male, or even before tea when you wanted to be passing more as male, did you have a lot of inner dialogue around how things you were doing or how you moved or did whatever? And how was that inner dialogue for you at that time? Before I really understood what being trans was for me, I definitely thought that to be a guy I had to be butch and I had to like girls and I had to present myself in a certain way and I was so awkward. It was not working out so well. and. When I started to be exposed to more variety of queer people, I saw I could pick and choose the things about myself that I liked. And so I could have something that was pink and not be like, oh, God, I have something pink. Someone's going to know I'm a girl. It's odd now when I, I still find myself doing things that I was comfortable doing when people thought I was a girl and then getting completely different reactions. Like I started dancing this year and... Because I'm really new to dance, I take class with like 12-year-old girls, and I thought, oh God, their parents are going to think I'm some creepy old dude who's like trying to mack on their little kid. It just, I was so worried about how they would see me because I was this older guy taking classes with these younger girls. But if I was a girl doing it, people would, wouldn't really think much of it. And so it's just, every now and then, I'll have to kind of readjust my boundaries just because it's so different. Like the first times I started using the men's restroom, you know, I was really curious. So I'd be looking around and you know, I learned pretty quick. You don't make eye contact. You just, you just go straight to what you have to do and then you leave. And I guess I didn't see too much of it because this is how I've been presenting myself. Like I've, I cut my hair by myself when I was six. And then ever since then I had short hair and there's a lot of confusion about, is that kid a boy or a girl? But you know, most of the time people would see me as male. And so I kind of got those social norms. And also, I was raised by my paternal aunt who adopted me, and she deserves like the best mama word. But uh, 
she's also a lesbian, so I had early exposure to the queer community through there. And so I don't feel like I had too many of the, you're a girl, you have to wear dresses, you have to act this way. But there were times when, when before I felt really comfortable with myself, early, early transition, I thought that if I showed any hint of femininity, it would be taken, oh, like, that's just a lesbian, because kind of looks like a dude, but that's a chick because she did something really feminine or something like that. And so, but then as I got older and I started to transition and felt more comfortable with myself, it's actually strange because for a small time I felt like, well, I do kind of like the binary system because it's helping me pass because there's kind of like a guideline for how guys should act. But throughout the years I've picked and chose like, well, I can, you know, I'm, I feel more comfortable being more feminine with this or more butch with that, I suppose, because... I feel comfortable with how I present myself to the world, I suppose. In the film, you talked about being a fag. Can you say anything more about being a fag and what that means to you? I feel like so many people have so many different definitions about what being a fag is, whether it's negative or positive. And I guess for me, the word itself kind of ties into my gender identity as well as my sexual orientation. It's kind of like not letting either my sexuality or my gender identity kind of affect how I present myself to the world. So like being a fag to me meant being a guy, but still being able to be interested in the things I want to, whether it's girly or, you know, whatever. Just because I'm interested in Taekwondo doesn't mean that I'm some butch dude because, you know, I also like to dance. You know, just being a fag to me just means being who I am regardless of either identity or orientation. Over the last few months, and actually in a few of the episodes, we've talked about Kate Bornstein's kind of perspective on doing gender s- to attract the ones you like. So I think on one episode we talked about sex attraction and desire, and we talked about doing gender for ourselves and how we make ourselves feel good and make ourselves feel sexy, but also how we do gender to get the attraction of others, the ones we want to like us. So how has your gender queer identity played into attraction, desire, and the doing of gender? I feel like... It's tricky because most of the time I just dress for my like I I definitely dress for other people like I'm definitely like oh I'm going to like dress this way today and like look super like cool or I don't you know whatever but mostly I just dress cuz I dress the way I feel like I want to dress and so mostly I don't attract the types of people <laughs> like I like which really kind of bums me out sometimes <laughs> like really like femi girls are into me a lot and I'm like ah I'm so not into you <laughs> but I think for a long time just because I am sort of like this very sort of like butch sort of presenting person and I'm I'm not always that way but like most of the time that's just sort of who I am like I've always sort of been like painter pants car hearts like kind of like flannel shirt kind of kid like it's more practical in my eyes. Um, but for, like, the past couple of years, from when I was, like, 15 to, like, 17, I always sort of th- would be, like, crushing on people, but I wouldn't realize it because I was, like, I just think these people are cool because I, I felt like I couldn't be attracted to those people for some reason because I was under this expectation that I had to be, like, attracted to, like, feminine girls. And so, like, I'd be, like oh, I totally have a crush on, like, that person, but I was like, but that's just a friend crush, or that's just, like, I think they're cool, so... I want people to be into me because I'm me. My mom likes to critique me a lot because I'm... Because <laughs> I'm really awkward, and she's like, you know, you should stop being so awkward. You need to talk to people. You need to be like this and this and this. And I'm like, but but I'm so awkward. Like, one one, that's really hard for me to talk to people, and also, like that's who I am, like, they need to know what they're sort of getting themselves in for, you know, like, <laughs> not the... Plight of a shy kid. <laughs> I mean, I, di- I, I dress for people sometimes, like, but that's mostly just me being, do I want to be super grungy today, or do I want to be, like, you know, wearing, mm. like, a vest and, like, my really, like, nice, nice shoes today, or that kind of thing. Yeah, like the doing drag, where we do drag for ourselves, or... For a particular event yeah I think so much of it is like things is for myself I sometimes like I'll have a sock in my boxers but I'm not packing for other people really I'm doing it for myself because it makes me feel good like sometimes it is for other people mm-hmm. and like sometimes you know like there's been instances where 
I've just been, like, feeling super gay that day. And so that's the day when I'm wearing, like, a muscle tee and, like, my, like, one pair of skinny jeans that occasionally I pull out and look ridiculous. But, yeah, it's it's mostly I'm just, I'm just myself. And I hope people recognize that. And if they don't, that's <laughs> just too bad <laughs> yeah. for them. And, yeah, I don't know. So the plight of the masculine presenting person that doesn't want to attract films <laughs> spans the test of time. There's plenty of plight in our arena, too, so just I know, saying. You can like, have them all. <laughs> thank God. Yeah, I mean, I am into women sometimes, but it's like most of the time it's just like, you know, like super tough girls who are just like, I feel like. I'm into people who don't necessarily need to feel like they are that specific gender. Like, they don't need to prove, like, I am a woman or I am a man. Like, people who are just more comfortable with themselves. Well, you guys mentioned a few things um, throughout the podcast, and I think we'll try to post some links for that. Thank you, Quinn and Zane, for joining us for GenderCast Episode 6, and this wraps up our focus on queer youth. And thank you very much for being here. Yeah, it was really great to have you guys on. You guys were both awesome. And I think, too, for our listeners out there, try to get involved, save queer youth spaces. It's a great way to start activism, and I think that's where we're headed. Welcome to Episode 6 Check-Ins. We're going to start with our first check-in called Trantasy Land, and that's our check-in in imagining if the world were a gender-free zone and what the world would be like. And so we're going to talk about the concept of public space. So this comes to you from a blog entry from Ivan Coyote, and it's entitled Bathroom Encounters of the Binary Kind. And basically he had an experience in the bathroom and started to think about the word public and how we refer to it as public spaces, public bathrooms, public changing rooms. And here's your food for thought. The dictionary definition of the word public is interesting. And the definition is, of pertaining to or affecting a population or a community as a whole, open to all persons, pertaining or devoted to the welfare or well-being of the community, of or pertaining to all humankind. I think if we were to continue calling gendered bathrooms and change rooms public spaces, then we have a lot of work ahead of us. This just goes to comment and reflect upon if something's public and it's supposed to be beneficial for all of us, why is it such an obstacle for those that are gender nonconforming? So in a fantasy land, there would just be gender neutral bathrooms or public spaces would really reflect public welfare. And it also makes me think we all pay taxes into a system that then provides a lot of those public bathroom spaces and it seems like it should be equal access for all and it, this is another area where I feel like trans folks are treated like second class citizens. We'd love to hear your bathroom buzz stories and locker room lowdown stories. So if you do have something that you wouldn't mind sharing with us, it can be anonymous, and we'll just read your email and tell your story on the air. But we'd love to hear from you all on your bathroom stories. So the next segment of our check-in is going to be local events. And just like Bathroom Buzz, if, if you guys out there know of events happening that we don't mention, please email us, and we'll try to get on the next podcast so that we can let people know about your event or about events you think would serve our listeners. So on March 30th, Michelle T. and special guest Rebecca Brown, Amos Mack, who's one of the makers of Original Plumbing Magazine, and several other folks are going to be up here at Hugo House from 7 to 10. Richard Hugo House is at 1634 11th Avenue in Capitol Hill in Seattle. And it looks like a pretty fun event. It looks like it's 10 bucks advance and 15 at the door. One of the next events that we're going to announce is done by the Producers Collective. And it's a DIY, which stands for Do-It-Yourself Queer Film Festival. So that's going to happen on Sunday, April 10th from 1 to 5 p.m. at Northwest Film Forum right there on Capitol Hill. And it will basically feature queer short videos from Seattle and beyond. It looks like there's a screening at 1 and 3 o'clock, and the suggested donation is $5 to 15 The next event, and this aligns well with our March topic series on queer youth, is a benefit for Queer Youth Space, and Queer Youth Space is in fundraising mode right now to actually get a space designated for them. And it looks like the folks that put on Lick, so DJ Mathematics and Dewey Decimal, are going to help out with that and host an all-ages party for both adults and youth 
to benefit Queer Youth Space, and that's on April 15th. It's a Friday from 8 to 11 p.m., and it's going to be at the Vera Project, which is an all-ages space that hosts a lot of, like, local music events and things. And the theme is Queers in Space, so they're saying to come in your favorite space gear. And it looks like they're going to do a photo booth. It definitely looks very lick-like fashion. So it looks like a fun event, and it's a fundraiser also. So come out and support Queer Youth Space. And I think we both wanted to just do a, a quick shout-out to Lick in their involvement. They've been really generous with hosting a lot of queer fundraisers. They also, at the last Lick, featured the Put This on the Map tour, and, and some of the proceeds, I think, went to, to that organization and that national um, tour that they just embarked on. So they've just been really good about bringing the queer community together and encouraging a very open queer space for all likes and loves and just doing some work with some good causes as well. The next thing we wanted to announce is uh, the Seattle Men's Chorus. Zane had talked about being involved in that project. It's going to be here on April 2nd and 3rd. You can find the information and details about how to get tickets and exactly where they're going to be performing on the Seattle Gay Scene website, so go ahead and check that out. And then the other thing I wanted to just put out there is that I just recently saw the program uh, that's on Oprah's network, believe it or not, called Our America, and it's hosted by Lisa Ling. And they just started in February, and I think they're only up to like four or five episodes, but they, the second or third episode they featured was around transgendered. So they covered um, a transgendered child. They covered different ages as well as different communities in different areas of the country. You can find snippets of that on YouTube, and you can also online watch the full like 28-minute segment. So in spirit of March being our focus on queer youth, the book that we posted after we did the initial Put This on the Map interview with Sid and Kennedy, we posted a book called The Transgender Child, A Handbook for Families and Professionals. And just in follow-up to posting that book, we, we did read a few things out of it at check-ins for that episode, but I wanted to read the section that they have just a little bit on gender fluidity, kind of more in appreciation of some of the dialogue that Quinn had presented just around being more genderqueer and gender fluid. And I thought that this was a really nice approach and good sort of food for thought, not just for parents, but just for anybody and trying to sort of support folks that are more along the genderqueer continuum or gender fluid continuum because we are really getting outside of the binary. The section is called, What Should I Do If My Child Is Gender Fluid? If your child is gender fluid, you have a challenging task at hand to resist the urge to make them choose. The agony of not being able to label their children can cause some parents such stress that they actually would prefer their child to be transgender. Yes, it may seem easier to have a transgender child or a typically gendered child, but that is not what you have. Remember to resist the urge to make your child choose for your greater ease. And I thought that this was just really resonated with me, not just in thinking about children, but just in thinking about all of us that don't identify with male or female genders that are more fluid or more genderqueer that it's not always, the end result is not always about choosing one or the other of those. And so this is a great book. It's a super easy read. And I definitely think if there's any parents out there listening that it's worth taking a look at and probably talk about some pieces of this book again. So the other check-in we wanted to feature this episode is quotes from the binary and I came across in my YouTube search this interesting segment and media awareness program essentially done by Justin Credaboy and his catch is basically ask a tranny and so he goes to places and holds a, a huge sign up and it says ask a tranny and some of the stuff that he gets on tape with these people asking questions is hilarious but I encourage you to check this project out I think it's really interesting and I think that we can all do kind of our own version of this and try to educate those that we wouldn't normally come into contact with about these issues. So the quote from the binary is, have you done the whole equipment change and all that? I just think it's hilarious. It gets back to the, do you have a penis? It always goes back to the penis, buddy. And I find it so interesting that most cisgendered people don't get inquired about their genitalia in their normal everyday life, but trans people do. <laughs> Right, can you just imagine if, like, every guy walking down the street, you could just, so do you measure up? You, you got at least six inches in there? The day would be certainly more, more humorous. So we definitely found that amusing. It's also sad, but definitely amusing. And we posted a link to the Ask a Tranny blog on our Facebook page. You can check it out. 
So that wraps up episode six, and our next podcast will be around self-care and ways that we, we do that. So tune in for that, and I hope you enjoyed episode six. I was a dirt beneath you.